Um, hello and welcome everybody to the Greater Travelers Rest Chamber of Commerce uh, Wednesday webinar series. Uh, this week we are here for Ask the CPA, a live Q&A session with certified CPA and small business tax expert Alex Rankin. Uh, this webinar is dedicated to answering your tax related questions and concerns and she's also going to offer some tax tips that you can implement uh, throughout the year. So who is Alex? Alex is a passionate about people and all things accounting. She especially enjoys working better with her clients uh, to better understand the financial aspects of their businesses, as well as helping them plan for future growth and expansion. Alex received her undergraduate degree in accounting from Wolford College, while also being a member of the women's golf team. After graduating from Wolford, she went on to earn her master's of professional accountancy uh, from Clemson University in 2012. Alex lives here in Travelers Rest, South Carolina, and when she's not working, she enjoys cooking and getting outdoors, and she also enjoys introducing young girls to the game of golf. She says that golf gave her so much, and she is very excited to be able to, to give back. So welcome, Alex. It's very, uh, we're honored to have you here for this, uh, this episode of Wednesday Webinars. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. It's always fun to talk about taxes. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I am a nerd and I do enjoy it, so. Okay, well, let's get our disclaimer out of the way. That's gonna be our next important step here. Of course, we want to uh, share with you that the information that's gonna be shared during this webinar is provided for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to substitute for obtaining accounting, tax, or financial advice from a professional accountant. Uh, presentation of the information via the internet is not intended to create and receipt does not constitute an accountant-client relationship and viewers are advised not to act upon this information without seeking the service of a professional accountant. So now that we have that out of the way, I'll explain how things are going to happen today. So we're going to jump into questions. Uh, the first few questions actually came through the registration process uh, when folks registered for the webinar, and the rest we compiled either from some emails from our small business community or questions that we've um, received in the past. So we just kind of compiled a bunch of them and uh, we're going to put Alex to the test today. So we'll go ahead and get started with our very first question. Alex, how will tax changes affect business owners in 2021? So that is still yet to be determined. Um, I'm taking that as the 2021 filing season, so 2020 tax returns. Mm -hmm. um, but both are still still be determined. Um, I think a lot will depend on yesterday, um, which means we won't know for a little bit longer. And then usually if there's a change, then we may not even know until early January and they make things retroactive. Um, with Corona this year, even if there's not a change, I wouldn't be surprised if some things are not, they're either not extended or they let them sunset and then they decide not to let them sunset and we don't know about it until it's too late. Um, so it's, it, it's a really fun year to be tax planning. Um, it's nothing certain, nothing's in stone. Um, but this year, I'm gonna get a couple personal ones out of the way because most business owners in small areas like TR are pass-through entities. And so every, you know, they don't pay tax as a business, they pay tax on their personal tax returns. Um, so just a couple of quick, quick things there. Um, if you're over 72, there's no RMD. Um, they did that to combat the loss that all the stocks suffered in March. Um, they set that out and they said, okay, we're gonna let you leave your money in there and let it rebound before we make you draw it out. Um, generally, if you're over 72, there's an actuarial calculation that tells you how long you're gonna live and they tell you how much money you have to take out every year. Um, they are holding that and postponing that this year and they're not gonna make you do a double one next year. Um, this kind of goes on with a question later, um, are charitable contributions tax deductible? That answer, of course, is it depends. Um, and it depends on whether or not you itemize or you take the standard deduction. If you're a C Corp, they are obviously tax deductible. Um, but as a partnership or an LLC um, or an S corporation, it depends on each partner or shareholder's individual tax situation. 
Um, they do have a stimulus sort of in place this year that every taxpayer gets a $300 charitable contribution if you give cash contributions to charities, regardless of whether you itemize or take the standard for 2020 tax return. So that one's kind of cool um, and a much needed thing to stimulate um, the giving in a down economy. Um, one neat thing, they suspended um, required payments on student loans. And what they also did was allow employers to contribute towards student loans or the cost of education tax-free. No impact on the W-2, still deductible for the company. And you can do up to 5250 in 2020 for employees. So if you have an employee that is really struggling with that or that would be very grateful for that, that would be something to think of in place of a bonus because not, not, it won't be taxable to the employee um, and it's a cash transaction that would be very beneficial, especially since interest rates were suspended. It would go directly towards the principal of those loans, which would be, a you know, a, they'd get a double benefit from that. Um, Contribution limits have increased for HSAs and 401ks um, from over last year. HSAs by 50 bucks, 100 bucks if it's a family plan, 401ks, um, I believe it's by $500 over 2019. Um, but those are always good numbers to know to share with your employees if you have those types of benefits in place to make sure that they're able to take advantage of those deferred um, accounts to save taxes for them. Um, lastly, this, this is personal as well, but this is the most asked question of 2020. Is the stimulus taxable? It is not taxable. It is an advance payment of a refundable credit, very much like the Obamacare um, insurance credit. So if you receive the $1,200, you will not have to pay it back if for whatever reason they deem you ineligible on a 2020 return you have not received it, or if you were not eligible in 2018 or 2019, but you are in 2020, you will receive that as a, as a credit on your 2020 tax return. Same goes for if you had a baby in 2020 that the IRS doesn't know about, you will get that additional $500 in 2021 when you file your 2020 taxes. Um, another big one for businesses is that their net operating loss from 2020, if there is one, can be carried back immediately to 2019 and that return can be amended for an immediate refund. Um, and that applies to C-Corps getting a corporate refund or S-Corps and partnerships amending those returns and then amending returns of shareholders and um, partners as well. So that's a quick way to get cash in your pocket. Normally we roll those forward and you'd have to wait until you had a year with income to offset it. But if you had income in 2019 and a loss in 2020, you can carry it back for five years and amend the necessary returns to get an instant refund. Wow, okay. Awesome, that was a lot of information. I kind of wish we had all that on the slide. Okay. Well, I've got it all typed up. And so if everybody puts their email in the chat, I will uh, shoot out my answers where I've got them sort of documented just for, because I know it's a lot of information. And it's a lot of words. Um, if I put them in words on slides then everybody reads instead of listens. Yeah. So I, I, I will provide it. I just didn't want it to be on slides because it can be confusing and people read ahead and yeah, and I'd love to be able to put some of that um, on our on our website as well. I think that would be fantastic. So I am getting some emails here and I'll make sure to provide those uh, to you. So, okay, awesome. awesome. So on to the next question. If I can get my slides, there we go. What are the benefits of owning investment properties in the name of an LLC? So the biggest, the biggest benefit is not a tax benefit. It is essentially creating a separate legal entity. So when you create the LLC that you're making the piece of real estate separate from you as the owner of the real estate and, and making it also separate from like the, it puts the operations there. So like, let's say your real estate's being rented and you rented it to four college kids and they threw a party and completely trashed it. If you don't have it in, if you don't have it in an LLC, 
if someone were, were to be hurt at that party or something, they could sue you. And now we have personal assets out there and we have the house that they were actually occupying. If you put it in an LLC, open a separate bank account and have everything completely separate, you've now set up a corporate veil. And what that does is it allows to show the IRS and attorneys and whoever else needs to be shown that you guys are completely separate entities and you don't do any commingling of funds or transactions. Um, I recommend it if you have a business owner occupied building. So like if I owned the building I was in, I would own it in a separate LLC from Trailside LLC, CPA LLC. And then I would have a lease in place to rent it to Trailside. Um, it's just something you, you never want real estate in operating entities um, for legal purposes. Um, it also gives you um, some advantages in retirement. Let's say I decided to sell Trailside CPA, the operating company, but I wanted a monthly check in my retirement. I would still own the building and whoever was my new tenant, I could get that without having to do a lot more complicated stuff at the sale and at my retirement. So give us a lot more options and it also creates a separate legal entity. So it shields our personal assets. All right, to the next one. Uh, let's see, when first establishing your business, what are key areas to really consider for tax breaks and incentives or credit? I imagine this could be a very long answer. <laughs> well, I kind of simplified this one. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that it depends. Um, are you going to be a construction company that hauls concrete and you need $200,000 trucks to even get started? And so it's going to cost $2 million worth of just infrastructure to get going. In that case, you're probably not going to pay too much tax the first year because you've got to come, you got at least a couple million dollars to absorb as a hurdle from the beginning. If you work from home and your brain is your biggest asset, then we have some other tax things to consider. Um, so it, it very much depends. Um, it also depends if you have staff or it's just you and how you're organized and how you're going to be taxed. Um, and it also greatly depends on your personal tax return. If you're married to a doctor, we want to do as much as we can to lose money that first year. So take advantage of depreciation and all of that stuff because our operating loss can offset our spouse's doctor income and help us save money in a very high tax bracket. Um, if there's no money, like my personal, what I did last year is I worked and had a W-2 the first half of the year, and then I did a complete renovation of the building. So I had quite a bit of cost there um, to overcome, but I didn't want to lose more money than, the than to get rid of my standard deduction. So I made sure that I played with depreciation and really set myself up to take advantage of all the tax credits available, but also make sure that I didn't get rid of anything that the government's giving me for free, like the standard deduction. So you need to take a huge big picture approach when you're first starting, and it really varies from person to person, company to company. Um, two things that you can really think about tax credit wise. Um, in South Carolina, it sunsets in December of 2021, so you got a year to do it. Um, they have the abandoned building revitalization credit. So if you purchase an existing building and you leave the original four walls, you can uh, get a tax credit for up to 25% of revitalization cost up to $500,000. So that's $125,000 tax credit. Um, I call it the Walmart tax credit because they only stay in place for like four to eight years and then they leave it, abandon it and move to a new Walmart location. Um, if you were to go into said old Walmart in TR, a great option is the Ingalls building. If you were to leave those four walls and then revitalize it, you could have some sub substantial South Carolina tax credits there. Um, another thing to consider is if you're hiring employees, if you hire unemployable employees, those that have felons, that have disabilities, that have been on SNAP benefits for an extended period of time, then you can get the work opportunity tax credit. And I recommend that that is part of your hiring documentation because you may not know that they qualify. So I stick, you know, I recommend to my clients that you stick it in every single one of your um you know, just stick it in there with your W-4 in your packet and you may get lucky, but you can get up to a $6,000 credit per employee. So that one can be pretty advantageous as well. Okay. Are you ready for the next? I'm ready for the next one. Okay. 
can can you touch upon the differences um, of business types such as the LLC, LLP, LF, the S corp, and the C corp in particular? All right, let's talk about the C corp first. Um, C corps are are pretty rare in small businesses. Everybody that's Apple and Walmart and those guys are C corps. Um, they are completely separate entities. They ta they're taxed on themselves. They have infinite life. So if the owner of a C-Corp dies, it still exists and it can be, you know, ownership can transfer pretty easily and things like that. If a partner dies in a partnership, unless you have a great operating agreement there and a succession plan, then that partnership could be poof and you have to do a new partnership. Um, so the C-Corp is indefinite there. Um, it doesn't have any limits on classes of stock either. So you can have multiple types of stock like um, Berkshire Hathaway has some really great stock options that are $150,000 a share, or you can buy the regular regular people stock for you know a couple hundred, 300, 400 bucks a share. Um, you can't do that in an S corporation. You cannot um, have multiple classes of stock. And in an S corporation, you can't have more than a hundred shareholders. Um, a family unit does count as one though. So if a husband and wife can count as one person for that rule. Um, so all of them are flow through entities except for the C Corp. And what that means is that the owners of the company are gonna pay tax and that income is gonna show up on their 1040. And it's not going to be, you still file a tax return for the business, um, except in the case of a single member LLC that's not an S corporation. Uh, that goes on the personal return anyway. The others are definitely flow through entities. Um, they all offer legal protection in the form of protecting your personal assets, um, but in a different form. An LLC, we are joint and several, severably liable. So if Jenny and I are partners and I screw up and we get sued, Jenny can be liable if I am broke. Um, if we're in an LLP, that's not the case. Um, there's a general partner in an LLP, and then there's limited partners. So a limited partner is not liable, um, and the partners are not joint and severably liable in the case of you know, personal services. So a CPA firm, an attorney, an engineer, you see LLPs most often in professional organizations. Um, I also see them in families that have real estate holdings. Um, you will have mom and dad own a percentage and each kid owns a percentage. And then you'll have an S corporation as the general partner that owns maybe 1%. And uh, the reason they do that is because the general partner absorbs all the liability and it makes it a passive entity and you're not going to pay any self-employment tax in that case um, if you're managing several rental excuse me, several rental properties. So that's, you don't see LLPs as often. They're not legal in all 50 states. They're legal in about 40 of them. Um, but they're very similar to an LLC other than there's someone that does have liability. Okay. Um, let's see, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, actually one more thing. If you're an owner of a company, you can only be an employee of that company if it's a corporation. So you cannot get a paycheck from an LLC or an LLP unless the LLC is taxed as an S corporation. It has to have corporate status, be, meaning that it's gotta be an S corp or a C corp for you to get a W-2. Um, if you're in a partnership, you cannot get a W-2. I see that sometimes. That's a very misconstrued topic there. Yeah, that's, that's something that I, I had learned as a, a, a business owner. I got a disbursement as opposed to being paid in the traditional way. So I definitely, okay. So before I move on to the next set of questions, I'll just pause for a second to see if anybody um, in the audience just want to make sure if you have a question just based on what we've gone over already, certainly put it in the chat. Um, but otherwise, I will move on to the next slide and I'll, I'll monitor that. Okay, next question, Alex. Uh, actually, let's see in the chat here. Um, everybody says they're good. Okay, excellent. Uh, what is the structure for multiple unrelated businesses and what is the best strategy for both tax savings and asset protection? Um, totally depends on as far as tax strategy goes. Um, some of that's going to depend on income level. If you're low income, then maybe an LLC is fine. 
um, if you are high income, then an LLC could still be fine. Like, let's say you're a physician and you contract with the hospital. If you make $500,000, you're going to max out self-employment taxes anyway. So being an S-Corp doesn't really matter. Um, as far as multiple unrelated businesses, I would definitely say that you want them all to be completely separate entities. You want them to you want to try and mingle as little money as possible. If business A needs money and business B is rocking, then you want to take a distribution from business B and then you loan it to business A. Uh, you don't want to transfer too much money without paper trails. If you do transfer money from business to business, always make sure that there's a note um, and always make sure that you're accruing interest. Um, if they are related entities, you can use the AFR, which is usually pretty low. It's usually, I mean, right now it's probably nothing. Um, I haven't looked recently, but most interest rates are nothing. So that one's definitely going to be real close to nothing because um, it's always lower. Um, but I would definitely say the best structure will depend each for each entity will depend, but you want them all to be separate structures. Um, and as far as asset protection, that will also depend on what kind of entity and the entity itself may need to be separate. Like, let's say you own a construction company and you have tons of assets. We may want to have an operating company and a fleet company with a lease in place between the two so that the construction company doesn't actually also own the assets. Um, they just lease them from each other um, to keep liability even further separate. Um, so that one's a tough one to answer without more details. Okay. I'm going to pair the next three together because to me, they kind of felt like they belong together. Um, the, the minimum a business must make before filing taxes, um, losses under 5,000, are they deductible? And then of course, um, expenses with no income. So I figured I'd just group those together and kind of let you uh, address those collectively. So um, if you... There is not a minimum a business must make before tiling, filing taxes for the previous year. Um, the, so like in my instance last year, I was able to offset W-2 income from my previous job with my business expenses from starting this one. So it, you know, it helped, it helped to minimize my tax liability there. Um, if you just started on January 1 and ended up with a loss because you had to spend a lot more money to make money than a service industry would, then you can carry that loss forward with you to future years. So you always want to make sure that you file. Um, if you set up an LLC and get an EIN, the IRS is going to be looking for a tax return immediately on your EIN. It tells you when it's due. Um, so they know and you've immediately been added to their system. So you definitely want to be filing. Um, losses under $5,000 are absolutely deductible. Um, because of that $5,000, pretty specific, I'm wondering if they're referring to something specific. Um, so if you, if you wrote that question and you are referring to something specific, um, I would definitely ask that separately. Um, maybe shoot an email or something and we can see. Uh, if you have expenses with no income, absolutely file taxes. Um, you need to keep all of your receipts and paperwork anyway. Um, if you are not open, then this gets into some other questions down the road, like your startup cost can be expensed up to $5,000 and then amortized over, um, I believe it's, I can't remember the life, I'd have to look, but they get amortized if they're over $5,000. Um, so you wanna make sure that you know when you opened and what, you know, like, your Duke Energy cost to July 1st, maybe startup expenses, and then Duke Energy after that is gonna be operating expenses. Um, so they're just going to go on the tax return differently, but you wanna make sure you have all those receipts and you have the documentation for when you actually open so that those can be categorized correctly. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, what is a pass-through business and how is it taxed? I know you spoke to this briefly a little earlier. So it is taxed based on the individual's tax scenario. Um, if you're a member of an S-Corp or a partnership, the S-Corp or partnership will file a tax return and then the shareholder or partner will get a K-1. That K-1 is essentially the business version of like a W-2 for an owner. So it says, hey, this is where your income is. These are depreciation, interest, dividends, all sorts of different incomes there. 
like various types of income and then some specialty expenses or separately stated items will also go on those like charitable contributions will go in a separate place as well because those things are definitely subject to the individual's personal situation. Um, but you will add that to your personal tax return and it will go in cahoots with your W-2 and your rental properties and all that good stuff and kind of shake out at the end. It just gets added as ordinary income. Okay. All right. On to the next. I, we have lots of good questions. Uh, if you start to do business, what is the way to separate startup costs versus operating costs on your tax return? So by definition, startup costs are operating costs that occur in norm. They are operating costs if the business was open, but the business just isn't open yet. So you keep track of those just as you would if you were open, but you're putting them into an account on the balance sheet called startup cost. Um, and then the first 5,000 are deductible in the current year. The rest are amortized. Um, once you spend more than 50,000 to get started, they do a reduction in what you can take in the first year. Um, and it maxes out at 55,000. So once you spend 55,000, none of it is in the first year other than the amount that gets amortized. Um, okay. So you keep them separately pretty much by what date did you open. Anything before that is startup. Anything after that is operating. Um, same with organizational costs. That's not to be confused with startup costs, but very similar. Um, that's your legal and accounting fees and registering with the Secretary of State and all that good stuff. It's separate from startup cost. Everybody thinks of it as a startup cost, uh, but you also get five, the first 5,000 are deductible. Same rules, remainder is amortized um, up to 55,000, and it's just all amortized and no $5,000 deduction. Okay. All right, our next one I, I thought was really interesting that was submitted. I, I own a single member LLC in South, South Carolina that I started with a small business credit card. Do I have to save receipts for everything and how much documentation is needed to prove I'm separating my personal finances from my business? So you do need to save receipts for everything um, and you need to save them for three years. I recommend three years after the tax return is filed. Um, the rule is three years. They don't talk about the timeline, um, but the tax return can be examined for three years after the due date of the return. So I recommend keeping it. So like a 2020 tax return is due April 15th, 2021. I would keep everything until April 16th, 2024, um, just to be on the safe side. Um, but you must have a receipt for any expense that you take on the tax return, whether that be a capital expenditure for a new truck or a new, you know, Mac Daddy Apple that cost $28,000. We definitely want receipts for those. Uh, but we also want receipts for when you go to Walmart and you buy a pack of pens for $350. Um, the IRS is very, very clear that bank statements and credit card statements are not enough. And my example for that is I can go to Walmart and I can buy all business supplies and it shows up on the credit card as Walmart 5752. I can go to Walmart and I can buy personal groceries on the business credit card and it can show up as 5752. And the IRS has no way to determine if it's business or personal if you don't have the receipt. So that's why they want those. Um, you should keep the business and personal completely separate. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to have separate bank accounts. If you need to take a distribution to pay your mortgage, then LLC transfers money to personal account. All personal expenses are drafted from the personal account and never the business account. Um, but you need it needs to be very clean. Um, obviously, if you pull the wrong debit card, I bank at Bank of TR, the business card and the personal card are the same color. They look a little bit different, but in a hurry, you can definitely grab the wrong one. If you do that two or three times a year, I think you're okay. If you do that two or three times a week, you're not separate enough. Okay. Okay. Um, with two equal partners, is there anything to not forget or to keep in mind that is different from a single owner LLC? So I think the most important thing to remember when there are two equal partners is that no one has control. My vote is equal to your vote. And if we have differing opinions, nobody wins. 
Um, so that's different than a single member LLC because you have full control and your vote is the only vote. Um, it's like a little dictatorship there. Um, so that is uh, something to keep in mind. Um, if one of the equal partners is a female, if that person has 51% versus 50, you're now a minority owned business. And so that can help you be a priority for grants. And um, if you, depending on your industry, if you can get government contracts and things like that, there are laws that the governments have to use X percentage of their expenditures on minority businesses. Uh, so that could be an advantage as to why maybe not to be 50-50 and to do 51-49 or something, just to keep in mind. Um, in a partnership, an operating agreement is a non-negotiable. I don't care if it's a husband-wife partnership, a brother-sister partnership, two best friends. Money is evil and it will make people not like each other. And if there is not something in writing in the beginning that says this is how things happen, it can get ugly pretty quick. Um, so for a partnership, an operating agreement is the most valuable thing you can do at startup. Um, I think it's also to remember that in partnerships and multi-member LLCs, whether it's 50-50 or not, each partner is taxed on their personal tax return. So Jenny may pay 30% on her income and I may, I may only pay 12%. So you need to make sure that you take a big overview of both people's tax returns when you're doing your tax planning for businesses and coming up with strategies. Um, you want to make sure that you're not missing something on both partners tax returns because they are flow through entities. Um, so just a, there's a few more moving parts when there's more more people involved. Okay. All right, excellent. So let me pause again uh, before I go on just to make sure no one has put anything in the chat box and it looks like uh, we're still good. So here we go. Can you discuss things that are considered tax deductible for a business owner? So I read this question as a single member LLC, um, maybe the type of people that are working from home and they're wondering what can they expense. They cannot expense their wardrobe unless they logo it. Um, most, because I've had, I had an interior designer come in the other day and she wanted, she was curious, could she expense her wardrobe because there's a certain level of dress that is required for a certain level of client. And the answer is no, you can only expense your wardrobe if it's A, required by your industry. Um, I have engineers that are required to wear those Carhartt pants that have three layers on the front and big steel toe boots. They can, de they can deduct those even though they're not logoed. Um, but me as an accountant, I can wear my clothes downtown on Friday just as easily as I can wear them to the office on Monday. So they do not allow those to be deductible. Um, so that's a big one that's overlooked. Also meals. Meals are only deductible if they're at the convenience of the employer and serve a business purpose. Um, so just uh, the most common one that I see, I have clients that will go to Chick-fil-A every morning because they're on their way to work. That's not a business meal. Um, that's personal. Don't pay for it on the business credit card. Makes my life easier at the end of the year. Keeps you a little more separated um, from the business entity. Um, so those are two commonly mistaken ones, uh, but you're definitely going to want to keep up with utility cost. Um, obviously, if you're renting a building, liability insurance, that's a must for every business owner. Even if you don't think you need it, you do. Um, computer cost, you want to track your mileage. Mileage is something that a lot of people forget about, but if you drive 10,000 miles a year, that's a $5,700 you know, tax deduction. Um, so it's a good, you know, definitely keep up with mileage, especially if you're a realtor or something like that, where you pretty much your car is your office. Um, that can be a big one. Um, technically, your cell phone is not deductible unless you have a home phone as well. So you need a second phone to deduct a cell phone. Uh, that one I get a lot of groans about, but that is the rule. I'm hoping that eventually they will update that rule. I feel like that rule is outdated because it was written before there were cell phones. Um, and they just sort of, you know, you have to have two lines to have a business line and a personal line. Uh, but I think that sort of has worked over time. And I'm hoping that as they start looking at the gig econ economy and those type jobs that they'll see that that rule needs a little clarification. Um, 
but pretty much anything that is in the ordinary course of your business and is required for you to make money, it can be deductible. Um, be smart with that. Don't be flamboyant. And just because you take a client to a meal, don't spend $2,000 on that meal because you took a client to that meal. If you need to purchase a vehicle for the company, uh, they have limitations on the depreciation based on how nice they are and what business pur purpose they serve. Um, so, you know, it's always, you know, but anything generally in the ordinary course of business, you, you can generally deduct that. Um, and keep up with it. I would say keep up with it and then go to your tax preparer at the end of the year. They'll tell you what you can and cannot use. Um, so I do think it's important to make sure that you'd rather have more than you need than not enough. Um, it's a whole lot easier to say, no, that wasn't deductible than it is to send you on a goose chase to find things that are 12, 14 months old. Okay. And I think you already answered uh, this one, are charitable contributions tax deductible? I did. Okay. Um, if I draw a monthly salary from my sole proprietorship, is it classified as an expense for my business or how does it get taxed? So you cannot draw a salary from a sole proprietorship unless it's a, an S corporation and is flowing through payroll. You're paying payroll taxes on it and it ends up on a W-2. Okay. All right. You can take a monthly draw, but that's just a dividend and that's not taxed. The money that the company makes is taxed, whether you leave it in or take it out as a dividend. Um, so if you're, it, it would not be called a salary though. It's just a return of profits for you. Okay. And I, I thought this one was interesting. And I know that we do have a, a couple of um, businesses in, in TR that do um, international sales. So uh, what should be considered and how to deal with multiple state and or international and foreign sales taxes for products and services that are sold online? And if I sell my product on Amazon, will I still need to file for a sales tax? So the services that are sold online are gonna be taxable to the state in which the service is provided. So let's say this was a build thing and everybody paid to see the seminar today. I'm sitting in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. It's income to South Carolina. I'm not shipping anything. I'm not creating any nexus or anything like that. Um, so the services are generally a little bit simpler. Uh, products that are sold online, uh, are, de are totally different. And the answer is it depends on the state. Um, California, you don't have to collect California sales tax. If I, if I live in California and I purchase the product and you ship it from South Carolina to California until I believe the number is 400 or $500,000, you don't have to cal calculate their sales tax and collect it on their behalf. Um, North Carolina is $100,000 or $200,000. Every state has a different threshold, so that totally depends on which state you're collecting in. Um, it also depends on which state you ship out of. If you're here and you have a you drop ship things out of Wisconsin, then you're going to have you know you're going to have more issues there. As far as international, um, that's going to depend on each country. And to be completely honest, I don't get asked about international enough, so I don't really keep up with international just because it's a lot of information and every company's different, and I don't get questioned enough about it to spend my time on it. Um, so that would be a case by case thing. Um, I'd be happy to look into it or refer someone that does do international. Um, but I just usually stay away from international. Okay. All right. So we're, we got about 20 minutes. So we're going to go ahead and move up, move ahead to our next, if I can get my slides to work. Here we go. Um, are you required to file a separate return if both partners or husband and wife filing joint personal returns? You are, if it's a partnership, absolutely. Um, generally, if it's a business that operates, I require, I usually recommend leaving it as a partnership and going ahead and filing that tax return and such. Um, I do also have where kids will inherit property and they'll put it in an LLC just to sit there. And that is by definition, a multi-member LLC, which is a partnership. Um, you can file a tax return the first year well, any year and make an election that says, hey, we know that we're supposed to file a tax return. Um, pretty much this entity just pays insurance and, and property taxes. We'll each take half on our, on our personal tax returns. So you can do it even if it's not a husband and wife. Um, I don't usually recommend it making that election unless it's real estate. And then you can just stick it on schedule E um, or capitalize those carrying costs if it's just a piece of land that's sitting there. 
Um, but the answer is unless you've elected out, yes, you do have to file. Okay. How does one plan out taxes for businesses if they register in one state and operate in another or a few others? And how does that apply? Um, that depends on what operate in another means. Um, if you actually have a physical presence in another state, then you're going to want to make sure you keep income and expenses allocated to each state separately. And you're going to have to file in every single state that you operate. Um, like, for example, a professional football player plays 12 games a year and half of them are in different states. He files and has income allocated to every state he plays a game. Um, businesses operate exactly the same. If you're shipping, that goes back to your different rule. Where did where are you located and where was the person the purchase made? And um, is it for services or products? Um, if you have a business and you live, let's say you lived in Texas and now you live in South Carolina and you're just curious, how do you move it? You can actually move the LLC and register it with the state of South Carolina as a foreign entity. And then you would no longer file income allocated to the previous state. Um, you would just associate it with your new state. Um, so that kind of depends on what you're doing and what the, what the purpose is. But if you have physical presence in that state, then you have to file tax return in that state for sure. Sounds like a lot of times answers um, to, to tax and accounting questions are the same as, as labor law attorneys. It depends. <laughs> it really depends. On the the only answer that, is, that I know for sure is it depends. Um, yes. It's kind of like buying jeans. If they fit you well, they may not fit me well because we have different body types. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's not a one size fits all in the tax world for sure. So I know that um, most of, of who we have are probably not C-Corp, but um, this question was asking if a C-Corp is showing a profit for 2020 and we'll pass this into our taxes owed, how can we alter our accounting or use the profit as a reinvestment into our company to eliminate our book profit and owner tax burden? Um, that just totally depends um, on the size of the company um, and your gross revenues. Are you cash and accrual? Um, do you have needs for equipment before the end of March 2021? If you do, buy them this year um, and use those tax savings to, you know, take those to your advantage and use them to purchase the equipment. Um, it can also depend on what industry you're in, how much inventory you normally stock, the cost of running the business. Um, do you have employee benefit plans? If not, that's something you can implement. Um, because happy employees usually do better. That's something that's not going to pad your pocket, but it could absolutely enhance the company and could be a way to reinvest into the company without instead of reinvesting in the government. Um, generally, I also like to remind people that the cheapest thing to do is pay the tax. A C-Corp's tax rate is 21%. Um, if you spend $100,000 to not pay tax, then you're out $100,000 instead of $21,000. Um, so it's definitely a, hey, let's weigh the benefits, let's do a two or three year plan and see what we actually need versus what the tax, you know, paying the taxes is gonna cost us. Cause sometimes it comes out, sometimes the answer is to pay the taxes. Sometimes the answer is, hey, we do need this in the future. Let's go ahead and bite the bullet and do it now. Um, so you know, that's a tough question and it's very specialized to the actual. Um, you can also raise wages if somebody hasn't maxed out their um, 401k yet as an owner, you can go ahead and give them a bonus that's gonna you know, eliminate the double taxation portion. And if they defer that income into retirement accounts, um, that eliminates the taxation of it, at least for now, it's gonna defer that into the future. Um, but it, it again depends, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll pause for just a second as we get ready to head into our next slide. I see that we have um, another participant. Hi, Brandy. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Um, okay. So we have about 15 minutes and it looks like we'll probably, we'll probably make it through. So here we did receive a lot of questions, um, including for me about home-based businesses, um, and home-based business with high costs, such as electric or gas or another utility that wouldn't be incurred if it wasn't for the business. What are some ways that we could claim those business expenses at tax time? 
So um, you get like, if you have an office that's dedicated specifically for your business, um, like let's say your house is 3000 square feet and a 300 square foot office in your home is business only. Uh, what you do is take a ratio of all those expenses. Um, so you, if you turn in 12 months of utility bills, your mortgage interest statement, um, property insurance, um, if you pay for trash separately, um, I know mine is billed on one of my utility bills. Um, if it's not, you can definitely uh, take that into account, but those will be ratioed for you. Um, I generally take the cost of a phone and the internet, uh, depending on what kind of business you're doing, um, as full business expenses and not ratio those out. If you are in construction or landscaping or something like that and you have a shed, um, obviously we're gonna allocate more because you're going to have a bigger space and uh, sometimes those actually are on their own meters for energy and things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on those, but you definitely want to make sure that you know the square footage of the business space and the square footage of your home and you can keep those utilities and keep all of those expenses together. And at the end of the year that will go into your home office deduction. Um, also working from home, in my opinion, um, mileage is a huge tax break for working from home. Um, me, I drive to the office every day and that's not deductible, that's the commute. Um, but if you work from home, then you don't have a commute and pretty much any time you leave for business purposes, um, that mileage is now deductible. Uh, so that one's kind of a hidden benefit of working from home, especially for people that have to make trips to the post office and things like that. Like your people that are selling on Amazon and they're shipping and things like that or Etsy. Um, I think they sometimes forget that driving six miles to the post office can really add up if you go every day. Um, okay, awesome. Okay, the next one. Uh, what is the best way to keep file paperwork throughout the operating year so that we're organized and prepared for tax season? There are so many different things out there that you can do depending on your volume. You can keep a spreadsheet. Um, I have several clients. I've set up sort of like a bank reconciliation spreadsheet for them and we have our beginning balance, our deposits, a few expenses that they have, and then our ending balance so that it's like a big bank reconciliation, but it also categorizes the expenses. Um, it's also free, which is really nice for some of my smaller businesses, or maybe not even small, but just not a huge volume of transactions. Um, you can use QuickBooks, you can have a bookkeeper. Um, I may only be 31, but I'm very old school and I have a folder for every month and I stick every receipt in there. And at the end of the month, I seal it off. Um, I keep my accounting in an accounting software, but I also keep all my paperwork literally in paper in a folder in my desk and at the end of the year I rubber band the 12 months and I stick it in the back hopefully never to see it again um, but I keep it for my however you know three to five years just in case um, it's going to totally depend on what works for you some people like to scan everything and keep those folders on the computer that's totally fine um, but I would definitely recommend organizing it either in a spreadsheet or using QuickBooks FreshBooks Wave is free um, Wave only works for super, super simple, um, but I think that that's something that would, you know, organizing it as you go is a lot easier than, you know, waiting and dropping nine months off at, at an accountant's office and hoping that they can catch up before you need to refinance on Tuesday kind of a thing. Um, my, my recommendation would be to do it sooner rather than later because it can get pretty overwhelming if you don't. Um, but the way you do it is totally up to you and how you work and what works best for you. And it's going to depend on also like what kind of information you want your reports to tell you. Okay. Looks like we have just a couple more. So we're doing really good on time here. Um, the next question is, what is the difference between a CPA and a bookkeeper? And is, not, is it not necessary for a small business to utilize? And then how much should a small business estimate for these services? So the difference and how much should they estimate? So I'm pretty brutally honest when it comes to is it necessary for you or not? Um, and the answer there is also it depends. If you have a journalism degree and or maybe you're a graphic designer and you hate numbers, it's probably gonna be cheaper for you to pay someone to do it than it is for you to pay someone to fix it. Um, and it's gonna be a lot less frustrating because if you did it and it took you hours and then you have to pay me to fix it, you're gonna have a little bit of a grudge there. So probably going to have to pay for it if you if that's not the side of the brain you work in 
if you've been a bookkeeper for a long time and you got you and your husband have a construction company and you want to do the bookkeeping, then it may not be necessary to have that function. Um, but I would definitely probably have a CPA for consulting on the tax side of things, especially as you grow and just to make sure that you're in compliance and that you're forward thinking. Um, the biggest differences in a bookkeeper and a CPA, a bookkeeper generally is data entry and reconciliations. Um, they can prepare payroll, sales tax, accounts payable and receivables. Um, they generally get all of the information in and then the CPA will analyze that type of information. Um, so they, CPAs usually do business advisory services. And what I mean by that is they help you interpret the financial information that has already been compiled. Um, and they translate that into a tax plan and return preparation. Um, they can help you get financing. Um, I generally sometimes will provide charts and graphs to my clients that I know are not numbers oriented because numbers I know they immediately put a wall up and they're overwhelmed. So I, my job as an accountant is to be is to take financial information that people don't understand and put it in words or graphs or present it to them in a way that they do. Um, it's like speaking a different language. Everyone's like, oh, you're great at math. Well, I have a four function calculator and that's the math that I do. Um, but what I do is try to make you understand what those numbers are telling you. Um, so what we aim to do would be to help you improve your cash flow. We can set your prices. We can help you come up with a budget, um, help you plan for the future. Um, and you generally see, especially for businesses that have decent volume, having a bookkeeper and a CPA is super beneficial um, for two reasons. CPAs are more expensive than bookkeepers, um, but many CPAs have on staff bookkeepers. So the bookkeepers you may deal with on a data entry basis, they pass the information along to the CPA and then you and the CPA sit down and go over the implication of the information that the bookkeeper compiled. Um, I would gen generally recommend, these are generalizations. Obviously, if you're at Elliott Davis or Cherry Beckard or one of those big guys downtown, these rates do not apply. They're not even close. Um, but here in little old TR, you can probably get a bookkeeper for $20 to $60 an hour billing wise. And a CPA is generally going to bill $150 to $350 an hour. I typically used a fixed price. So what I do is figure out what you want, how organized you are, how you present the information to me and how what it's going to take for me to get it back to you. And then I come up with a flat monthly fee for those services. Um, I find that it's easier for, for most of my clients to have something consistent as opposed to this month it took me four hours and next month it takes me two. Um, and having a, a sliding scale, I just try to figure out what is it going to take me to do the whole year and then divide that by 12 and come up with like a fixed fee. Um, and I generally have minimums as well. Um, okay. Wonderful. So this this uh, this last question came from um, Blaine Statham from the Bank of Travelers Rest. I thought it was kind of uh, cute to ask, um, how do you stay sane during the tax season? Or perhaps how do we stay sane? Well, um, I think the biggest thing that you guys can do for me to stay sane is not procrastinate. Um, I can't tell you how many tax returns I do in the last three weeks and how much sleep I don't get. Um, so anybody that comes in early is an absolute blessing and really does contribute to the sanity of an accountant. Um, any accountant that tells you that they're totally sane all tax season is absolutely lying. Um, there <laughs> are definitely points where we're ready to throw in the towel, um, but we do it because we actually, we love it and we love the impact that we make on our tax, you know, our tax clients, um, Usually by April 15th, if I never saw a tax return for the rest of my life, I feel like I'd be happy. But two weeks later, I'm ready to do, you know, start hitting the extensions and things like that. I do always take about a week off in May just to decompress. Um, tax season's pretty crazy. And so you sort of need that. Um, yeah, I, can, I don't I know if I'll be able to do that in a normal tax season as a sole practitioner, but that will be my goal is to get somebody on staff here soon and be able to do that again. This year was pretty nuts. Um, I hope that there's never a tax season like this one was. Um, it was pretty terrible. And every accountant that I have talked to 
even if they, I mean, they, some of them have been in business for 40 years and they all agreed that this tax season just sucked and it sucked in April, it sucked in July and it sucked again in September and October. It was just the gift that kept on giving. Um, so I'm hopeful that next year will be better, but I am very skeptical that it will be very odd um, and that it will also be delayed a little bit. Um, right, okay. Um, we're doing wonderful on time. We're actually to, to the end of our uh, webinar, but I wanted to stop and give an opportunity to uh, any of our participants who wanted to either uh, pipe in on microphone and ask a question or to uh, put it in the chat. Um, or if you can't think of anything right now, you can certainly um, you know, email and let us know and make sure to send that along to, to Alex. And as she uh, promised, she will uh, get us, uh, you know, if you put your email in the chat, she'll make sure to send you her, her notes from uh, today's session. So I'll just take a moment. Any questions from our audience? Look at my chat to make sure I'm not missing anything. I don't have any questions, but thanks, Alex, for giving this. Sorry, I came in a little bit late, but it's so nice and comforting to know there's a smart woman in Traveler's Rest who can help with all things tax and um, accounting related. So we appreciate you. This is nice. Well, I appreciate it. Um, that's a really awesome background you got there. What is it? <laughs> I actually forgot that it was still on Zoom call. So we did a murder mystery for Halloween last week at Brains, and I was stuck in the ballroom. Gotcha. I was not the murderer. Well, I was going to go with maybe somewhere in India, like a nice um, palace of sort. Um, <laughs> and I was also maybe thinking somewhere in the White House, you know, due to the election. So I wasn't sure. Yeah, maybe next time I will figure. I think I stole this from like Beauty and the Beast or something like that. But <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate you, Alex. You're doing a great job. Awesome. Yeah, I was, appreciate this it. Was wonderful. This was very, very good. I'll pop on to and put my hi. There I am. Um, okay. So the last slide that we have up here, of course, is uh, Alex's information. Uh, Trailside CPA is at 207 North Point Set. There's her phone number um, and the website. Uh, certainly feel free to reach out. And in the meantime, Alex, I will get you the uh, email addresses that were put into the chat room so that you can uh, send them over our notes from today. And uh, again, I thank you very, very much for being here for our, uh, our Wednesday webinar. And uh, everyone have a great uh, rest of your day and rest of your week. And I hope you all relax and, you know, don't watch the news for a bit. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, Jenny. Bye, Mary Alice. Bye. Bye. Yeah.